All right, we'll go ahead and begin. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining. I expect that there'll be some other uh, folks that will be joining uh, in, in the next few minutes, and I think we'll probably have some people come and go a little bit. But I want to appreciate, uh, I want to thank everybody for their time today uh, for joining. Uh, my name is Chris Nidal, as I said. I am a uh, one of the co-founders of the Open Air Collective, which I'll give you a little bit of a background on in just a few moments. Uh, and I'm also a policy consultant for the Natural Resources Defense Council. And we're excited to have this session today. It's an hour long, uh, and we're going to cover a lot of ground. And today's topic is carbon removal, uh, which is a subject of great interest to many folks in the climate space, including policymakers in Washington, D.C. And what we want to do today uh, for members of the New York State Congressional Delegation is to give a survey of the subject uh, to really start at a pretty high level, uh, definitionally, about what is carbon removal uh, by surveying uh, the science and some of the applications that are related to it. Uh, and then really talk about the economic opportunities, particularly with a lens on New York State, as we're going to share. Uh, New York is really strongly positioned to lead on this. In fact, uh, among the states in the U.S. was really one of the first to uh, take this seriously from a policy perspective and to start move things forward uh, to advance this new industry. And I'm going to give a short presentation uh, just to kind of set the table a little bit, lay out a little bit of background, and then we're going to get into the really the meat of the session is to have a conversation with um, an excellent panel of CDR uh, practitioners and experts uh, who uh, we're gonna talk, really kind of take a deeper dive. And that also gives you an opportunity uh, to ask questions. Uh, it's gonna be a very small group. We only uh, invited uh, members and the staff of the, of the New York State delegation. Uh, so you'll have an opportunity. You can post those in the Q and A if you want, and then we'll, we'll read them. Um, raise your hand uh, as we get to it, though, if you'd like to be on screen um, and uh, ask a question directly or have a bit of a conversation. Again, it's a small group, uh, so the format allows for that. So I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, again with my presentation to just give a little bit of hopefully helpful background uh, on the subject. Before I do that, just to give you some background on open air, uh, you'll be hearing from our members, I think, in coming months in different capacities. But Open Air is a uh, all citizen led, entirely volunteer uh, global carbon dioxide removal advocacy network. Um, we, found, we were founded in New York City just a few years ago and then quickly spread globally. Uh, we have members on every continent where, where people live and activities uh, taking place uh, in places all over the world now and uh, Europe and Africa and, and now in Asia as well. Uh, we have a thousand active members and we have a Five to 6,000 person mailing list. About half of those are actually uh, New Yorkers, uh, which sort of reflects where we got started. And what we do uh, as a group, uh, we do many things, but a key part of what we do is uh, legislative action. So that's a main part of our advocacy where we don't just advocate for legislation, we actually produce it. So our members study, interact with subject experts, the likes of some that you'll, you'll hear from on the call, to look at what the factors are where they are on the state uh, level mostly to date and formulate carbon dioxide removal support policies in the form of legislation, which we also write uh, and then get introduced. And then we citizen lobby. So our, our members directly engage to educate and persuade uh, policymakers uh, to support the policies that we've come up with. And somewhat of a unique feature of open air is we, wherever those policies might start, uh, we try to spread them to other places where they might be relevant. And that's what we call viral legislation. And to date, uh, pre presently, actually, um, we have uh, eight pieces of legislation uh, that have been introduced in multiple states, actually, including uh, abroad. This is just a, a survey of them. Uh, three have been passed into law uh, at the state level. Uh, some of them, like LECLA here, which is a low carbon concrete bill, uh, versions of that have spread to five states, and three of them, most recently in New Jersey, Governor Murphy signed into law just a few weeks ago that policy, and those all came from the open air uh, community. Um, and what we also have done starting in the last Congress, uh, we were very actively involved uh, in the review and gave input to uh, two really interesting pieces of federal legislation focused on carbon dioxide removal, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. Uh, with citizen and uh, citizen advocacy and engaging members and educating them. Now, what I wanted to, again, I think just give a bit of a high level background of the subject is what we'll talk about over the next uh, 12 minutes or so is what is CDR? 
uh, from a science perspective in terms of what the different applications, what does that mean and what doesn't it mean? Uh, what are the benefits of challenge, challenges of CDR? Uh, why do we talk about it within a climate and economic development context? What's the critical role of policy at the state, subnational, but also at the federal level in really giving rise to this critical sector? And then also really talk about what's special about New York. Uh, why should uh, uh, leaders that represent our state care about CDR? And then we'll get right into that expert panel. We're going to dig a little bit deeper into some of the things that I surfaced during my presentation. So one thing we always start off with, uh, it might seem very specific in particular, but it's really, really important. And I think when we talk about CDR, when you hear about CDR, it's often confused with another category of technology or climate intervention called carbon capture and, C and storage or CCS. These do overlap in some areas, particularly around the S part, the storage, in terms of where you put carbon, but these are fundamentally different things. So carbon capture and sequestration is a form of emissions avoidance. Uh, and that really refers to, in most cases, uh, stopping emissions from going up into the air, usually from industrial point sources. So it's a way of preventing emissions from going up into the air, um, where uh, CDR is different. CDR is actually where you're taking emissions that are already in the air, out of the air. So those are often conflated in the media and uh, in the advocacy community, but they're actually very different things and they have different rationales for why we want to support uh, both of them. Um, and where do we take our cues from primarily at open air and why is this of interest to folks in the climate space more generally is that CDR is necessary. Uh, it's not something that is a substitution for decarbonization or for adaptation. It's just something that we have to do now, given the level of emissions that we already have in the air and that are projected even under uh, the most aggressive uh, mitigation scenarios. So this is just a quote that I think sums that up from the most recent IPCC report, but the last several uh, assessment reports have made this quite clear. And what is CDR though specifically when we talk about it? And there's a lot of focus on particular solutions, but there's actually CDR is a, is a spectrum. Uh, there's many different ways to take carbon out of the air and put it somewhere. And these can occur on land or terrestrially and increasingly very, very promising solutions, very, very diverse solutions that are ocean-based or marine-based. And to give you just a very high level, we'll hear from our, our experts today where we'll, we'll parse this even further, but this is a useful breakdown of the spectrum. Probably what most people are familiar with are nature-based uh, carbon removal solutions such as afforestation and reforestation and increasingly uh, soil carbon. So building up organic soil carbon uh, in, in agricultural and other working lands uh, to take carbon out of the air. And then we have categories which we sometimes call bio storage or engineered bio storage that often fundamentally rely upon photosynthetic processes, just like uh, the nat natural sinks, but they involve other um, forms of engineering or technology or methods that really harden the durability and measurability of the carbon removal. So these are things like biochar, bio oil, biomass uh, injection, bikers and backs. We'll talk about what some of these things mean. And then in the ocean, things like uh, algae uh, sinking as well. And there are, there are others and variations of that. And then uh, mineralization, really exciting uh, area of carbon removal that's emerging quite quickly. Um, focus of a lot of research and private sector activity. Um, this just refers to many different things, but uh, different uh, chemicals and materials uh, and rocks that naturally uh, absorb carbon uh, when exposed to it and mineralization are processes that engineer to accelerate that, uh, to actually improve that, both in terms of their rate of carbon removal uh, and in their measurability. And then what many people, which probably makes the most amount of news at this point, we'll definitely be hearing about today, is direct air capture. And these are purpose-built machines that pull carbon out of the air, uh, that can either be put into products uh, or can be uh, sequestered uh, uh, underground uh, geologically. Um, and there's many different forms of direct air capture that have emerged uh, in recent years. And as I said at the at the top, we're really excited about it. Uh, I'm a, a native New Yorker, uh, as are many members in open air, that New York is just really, really well positioned from a resource perspective. Uh, we can't, you know, at scale do all of those solutions, but we have many different pathways that we could pursue in different parts of the state, in different sectors. Uh, related to agriculture. Certainly our extensive coastline on Long Island creates an amazing opportunity, not just the resource, but 
some really, really exciting projects and research that you'll hear about today. Um, lots of sequestration potential in the built environment and commonly used materials like concrete, as well as using mass laminated timber. And biochar, very versatile CDR pathway with many other benefits, could be used broadly uh, throughout New York's agricultural sector. And we also have been early to make real investments, uh, both in through public-private uh, partnerships as well as direct public investments, uh, in a trying to create a conducive environment for CDR research as well as uh, uh, company formation. Uh, we have two. Um, uh, just in New York City alone, incubators and accelerators that focus on carbon tech, uh, activate in the carbon to value. Some of the leading research in the world that's happening anywhere on various different forms of carbon dioxide removal are happening at our leading universities, such as uh, Columbia, Cornell, uh, Stony Brook University, a real center. And we're starting to see an ecosystem really take shape in the city uh, and state as well, where we're seeing CDR startups uh, actually being founded and located in New York City, which is actually in New York State, which is very exciting. And what we've also, on the limited amount of polling that's happened nationally, the one that is clearest that I know of is actually uh, was conducted uh, here in New York State around carbon removal and state carbon removal legislation, which I'll refer to uh, in just a few moments. But there's actually a very high level of support for carbon removal when it's described, what does it do, as well as policies that are designed to accelerate and support carbon removal businesses and projects. And this is very bipartisan, uh, uniquely so, I think. Certainly, we saw very high level of support uh, among uh, Democrats in this poll, 85% support, uh, very strong majority support among independents, and close to 60% support among Republicans as well. So there's a real uh, broad bipartisan support uh, for carbon removal and for state actions to help accelerate the sector. And so just to summarize, when we talk about carbon removal, what are the benefits? It's necessary for us to both mop up or clean up the excessive mass of greenhouse gases that we already have in the atmosphere, what we call legacy emissions. So taking those emissions out of the air because we've already emitted too much, we've waited too long to decarbonize, as well as from sectors that are just very, very difficult to uh, mitigate within a climate relevant timeframe. So these are sectors like aviation, uh, cement, and steel that are foundational to our economy and to our civilization. Uh, and we're gonna be using them and we're gonna use more of them uh, and we need another way to counteract those emissions and carbon dioxide removal fits in. In the long term, as we get better at this, as these solutions become better understood and most importantly become cheaper, we could actually look to overperform. So to actually pull more carbon out of the air from a, a deeper time scale to try to wind back the clock. That's an exciting long-term vision. But there's jobs to be produced from this. This is going to be a multi-trillion dollar sector. Uh, and there's major advantages to the both the nation, the nations and the subnational governments that take an early lead on it. And it's not only job producing, but it can actually augment and improve existing sectors, particularly agriculture. So that's very exciting. And we think that carbon dioxide removal fits very squarely in discourse and debates around climate justice. Um, it's the leading economies that have produced the most amount of emissions globally, but it's the countries in the global south that emitted the least are most vulnerable, particularly in the early, but also in the long term, to the negative impacts of climate change. So there's a real moral imperative, uh, we believe, for uh, the United States and states and other um, leading uh, uh, developed economies uh, to invest in taking carbon out of the air. Now, there's challenges that we have to address quickly. Um, and those are it's not well understood as I started. It's it's fundamentally confused with other technologies and sometimes People have a very narrow view of what carbon dioxide removal means and uh, who is advancing it. Um, many of the solutions that are on the more engineered side of the spectrum are very, very expensive today uh, because they're early stage. We need to bring those costs down just like we've done with scale and learning for solar, which is now the cheapest form of electricity in history, uh, wind, and now increasingly batteries and electric vehicles. Right now, until Recently, uh, there was no funding uh, for carbon dioxide removal of, of any substance coming from uh, federal or state governments. That has changed in recent years, even stretching back to the, the previous administration, but certainly during the current one. So we need to boost uh, the funding and financial support to get this off the ground. And then there's issues, which we'll definitely talk about today, about standards and monitoring, reporting, and verification, or MRV, about how do we know what's good CDR and that it's happened and that the the 
intended impacts are going to last for a long period of time. And so those, both those benefits and those challenges have translated in recent years into federal government commitments to elevate along with mitigation and adaptation carbon dioxide removal. And so this has been explicitly acknowledged by the Biden administration, the DOE and other agencies that in align with what we know from the IPCC, we have to take gigatons, that's billions of tons of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, uh, 10 billion by the middle of the century and double that by the end. And that's roughly the size of almost the oil and gas industry in reverse. So it's a major, major uh, project that we have to embark on. And the federal government is beginning to orient in pretty significant ways towards that end. And we'll again talk about these in details, but just uh, you know, a, a little high level view of some of the policies in recent years that have um, started to kind of catalyze. A lot of them have been on the federal level, more supply side oriented, a lot of really critical research around R&D, trying to replicate what we've done as a country over the, the last several decades to advance innovation with government support. We also have uh, through the IRA, the reform and transformation of a really critical tax credit, the 45Q tax credit, which was actually initially uh, implemented during the Trump administration that kind of expands eligibility for that, um, as well as uh, research and investment in more nature and agricultural based uh, solutions. So a lot has been happening in recent years. DAC hubs, you've certainly uh, probably heard about that. That's in progress right now where proposals for regional and state based DAC hubs uh, are already being uh, made public and, and submitted. So expect to see a lot from uh, resulting from this in the next uh, one to two years. But we've also seen on the, what you can say the demand side, creating demand, buying is so, so critical, just like it was for renewable energy and so many other innovations that are important to our daily lives and economy. It's really been the private sector that's really led to sort of stand up and say, we're gonna start purchasing carbon dioxide removal with an eye not just to negating our emissions, but to advance innovation, to particularly invest in those solutions that are early now, but we have uh, reason to believe have really large scale potential. And certainly at the front of that has been the frontier climate, which was really initiated with the really unprecedented um, uh, moves of Stripe, uh, followed by other leading uh, tech companies, uh, such as uh, Meta and Alphabet, uh, McKinsey, Shopify, and they have a fund of almost a billion dollars. And, and uh, Joanna, I'm, I'm on our panel today, will we'll update us and give us a closer view to make these early investments in these companies to give them, uh, get, give their projects a uh, real world footprint and to help uh, de find out which ones are uh, the most effective uh, and, and bring the, the cost curve down. And we also have the next gen CDR facility, which in some ways is similar. It's a corporate coalition. Uh, with companies like Swiss Re and, and others, uh, South Pole, uh, that are leading that fund as well. So we're seeing really, really exciting things that are happening on the private sector. And we believe they're creating a template for what federal governments and state governments can also do at a whole other order of magnitude in a much more transformational way. And as we get into the panel today and we hear from Joanna and others, that was kind of, I think, the in intent to a large degree uh, is to be able to model what the governments can do with the resources they can bring to bear to follow and adapt what they're doing in the private sector and do it at the federal and at the state level to have a much greater impact. And there already are in the last year, there's been um, a number of uh, pieces of legislation that have been introduced. Open Air, as I said at the beginning, has been very involved. Some of the most exciting and ambitious ones are in New York. The very first of its kind in the country was a bill called the Carbon Dioxide Removal Leadership Act which is still introduced. Uh, it was introduced in both chambers. A very similar bill uh, was uh, modeled and has been introduced in Massachusetts. And California has also introduced a very ambitious bill uh, called the Carbon Dioxide Removal Market Development Act, which focuses on uh, state-based purchasing of carbon dioxide removal. Uh, at the federal level, as we'll, we'll talk about, and this is probably familiar to folks that are on the call, um, we had the Carbon Dioxide Removal Leadership Act, the federal version that was introduced by Paul Tonko uh, initially in the House with Representative Scott Peters from California, and then shortly thereafter, Senator Chris Coons and Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. And this is a bill that has at its center the idea of procurement. It tries to fill that gap, and it scales up over time uh, to 10 million tons annually. Uh, it sets a price on the maximum price that carbon can be purchased at. Uh, it has a real orientation towards picking for innovation, not just for 
uh, what's best understood uh, today. And it adds all other kinds of selection features to really prioritize economic development um, uh, impacts in uh, disadvantaged communities and environmental justice communities so that the benefits of this emerging sector are not just for the climate or for particular places, but are distributed broadly. And then another bill that was introduced bipartisan uh, by uh, Senator Susan Collins from Maine, Senator Maria Cantwell from Washington, and then in the House by Representative John Curtis from Utah and also Representative Scott Peters is the CREST Act, or the Carbon Removal and Emission Storage Technology Act, which has some similar and some overlap with what uh, the CDRLA does. It has a lot of R&D investment as well, and it sort of expands uh, the federal government's um, uh, R&D to cover other forms of CDR that haven't received as much funding. But it also has a five-year uh, pilot program that's a CDR purchasing uh, program that's based on a reverse auction. And that's meant to um, discover what are the best solutions that can be that can be procured at the lowest cost. And it, it really prioritizes forms of carbon dioxide removal that are very durable. At least 30% would be forms of carbon dioxide removal that are a thousand years or more of uh, removal timeline. So with that, hopefully that set the table a little bit. Uh, now I want to get into really kind of the main event uh, for the remainder of the hour. Uh, we're going to have our panel join us. Uh, folks, you can go ahead and turn on your cameras and your uh, your microphones. I'll, I'll introduce you in just a moment. And what we're going to do, because this is a very uh, small group, this is a recorded session. So there was a lot of interest in today's session, a lot of conflicts as well in terms of scheduling. So we're going to send these, this recording to, to all of you who are attending, uh, but we're also going to send it to your peers and colleagues uh, that, that are um, uh, in the New York State delegation uh, as well. <clears throat> so let me go ahead and introduce uh, our panel. Um, uh, Heather, if you could just let me know, make sure that you can uh, hear me okay. Just want to make sure that I didn't. I can. Okay, excellent. So let me go ahead and start. Uh, I'm going to begin with uh, Tom Green, who's the CEO of Vesta. Uh, he'll be talking about uh, his uh, Ocean CDR company uh, uh, shortly. Tom began his career as a biologist, then spent 20 years in various corporate roles at Capital One, Lending Club, Bain and & Company, and Averon, spanning marketing, data analysis, communication, product strategy, project leadership, and general management. He's the co-founder of the UK climate change nonprofit, We Are Ancestors, and has advised the Nature Conservancy on strategy, and he holds an MBA from Harvard Business School. Thanks for joining us, Tom. Uh, next, we have Jason Hockman. Jason is the co-founder and senior director of the Direct Air Capture Coalition, based in New York City. In this role, he leads a global nonprofit multi-stakeholder coalition of over 70 companies, organizations, and institutions working to address climate change through the deployment of direct air capture technology. Previously, he helped craft the policy and regulatory contract promoting utility clean energy and energy efficiency efforts for Con Edison. And he has worked on climate and sustainability issues in the Department of Defense uh, and Demos. And he earned his MS uh, in global energy and environmental policy from NYU uh, and a BA in history and public policy from Brown University. Next, we have Dr. Simone H. Stewart. Dr. Stewart serves as the industrial policy specialist on the National Wildlife Foundation's uh, climate and energy policy program team with a portfolio focused on carbon capture utilization and storage, carbon dioxide removal technologies and other strategies uh, to aid in a just green transition for difficult to decarbonize sectors such as energy and industry. And last but not least, we have Joanna Klitsky. Uh, Joanna leads procurement and ecosystem strategy at Frontier the first advanced market commitment or AMC uh, for carbon removal. She manages the team's carbon removal procurement process and furthers initiatives to address ecosystem gaps like shaping frontiers approach to measurement and verification or supporting projects on project development. So thank you panel for being here. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing so I can see all of your faces and you can turn on your sound if that's okay. And I'd also like to introduce uh, one of Open Air's uh, activist volunteer members, Raid Ahmed, uh, who is based in Manhattan. He's a constituent of, um, uh, he'll have to remind us uh, exactly where he is. I know he's on the border, uh, border of- Yeah, it's in Jerry Nadler's district. There you go, Jerry Nadler. And Raid is going to help us pose some initial questions to the panel that we sort of crowdsourced from our community to get things going. And then we're just gonna have sort of a fluid conversation. And again, that includes you, so please do jump in. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Raid, you want to kick off with the first question? Yeah, thanks for introducing me. 
Um, so yeah, I'll just kick off with the first question. Um, and we're going to start with Dr. Stewart. So we're seeing more conversation, more innovation in climate than ever before. At the same time, there's a lot of debate about which solutions to pursue at this time around after years of climate inequity and environmental degradation. We get this question a lot, and I think the congressional offices might as well. And we'd love to hear from you. Why should we invest in CDR when we could invest in areas that prevent carbon generation to begin with? And how should we think about the social and environmental equity when implementing and supporting CDR projects on the ground? Yeah, thank you so much for having me today. I'm happy to answer that question. So it's kind of a two-part question. Um, so the first part kind of being why invest in CDR, especially um, when we could invest in other mitigation strategies. So firstly, I'd like to say that I, I think in NWF approaches the conversation as really a both and, that we should be doing both things at the same time. Um, we need to invest in CDR strategies now so they're prepared in the future when we need to deploy them. Um, but we should also be working to, you know, mitigate and decarbonize the economy generally. Um, so CDR right now is an investment for our future goals. So we on average emit about 40 billion tons of CO2 uh, into the atmosphere. And so in order to remove the, the tons we're emitting now, as well as the legacy emissions that Chris talked about a little bit in the presentation, um, we need to we need to deploy strategies in the future. And so a lot of the, the technology and the, the industry is nascent, but growing very rapidly. And so it's important that we are investing the, the money and policy investments now uh, to make sure that we have the strategies we need but at the same time, uh, it's really important for us, like I said, to, to scale down and decarbonize and move away from fossil fuels in, in the meaningful ways that we can to lessen the burden of what we have to uh, have to remove from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And so it's also um, it's also kind of a way to think about developing economic structures and developing technologies that you don't want to invest in them too late down the road uh, when you need to actually be deploying them. And one of the other ways that we like to think about the whole ecosystem of C CDR at NWF is that these strategies um, oftentimes are energy intensive. And so CDR really should be viewed as a part of an ecosystem with deploying other solutions. And so if you support CDR, you should support the deployment of other strategies like rapid renewables deployment and widespread transmission across the US. Um, so these tools have to be powered some way. So like I said, CDR is really a, a piece of the larger puzzle. But in order to be prepared down the road, we have to start making investments now. Um, and so then to the second part of the question about the, the social and environmental equity piece, um, firstly, I think it's really important, and this is something I say when I talk anytime about, about equity and justice, is that we have to really consider that justice issues don't exist in a vacuum, that climate justice, energy justice, environmental, social justice are all really intertwined. And if CDR is going to be a part of the larger kind of climate solutions that we're deploying, we really have to think very critically about how all of these systems interact. And so climate change is a threat multiplier, um, which means that if you belong to a marginalized or vulnerable population um, or, or group, then you're more likely to experience the ramifications of the climate crisis because of the inequity that exists in our, our, our systems. And so CDR should not in any way exacerbate or perpetuate any of those harms. And that's something that we have to consider as we're deploying um, these solutions. And I think because the sector is developing now, from kind of its foundation, this is a really great opportunity for us to begin to think outside of the box and outside of traditional kind of capitalist models of business um, that we're used to in order to deploy these solutions in a way that's going to be really equitable and just in the future. And I think doing that means meeting with communities early on, having kind of two-way discussions and not just thinking these are populations that we need to educate, but also populations that we can be learning from uh, because everybody has you know, expertise in their own lived experience. And so I think it's really about a marriage of the technological and economic and policy experience with the experience of, of uh, people who are, are living on the ground. And so the last kind of thing I'll say, I guess, is that any type of organization or company that is seeking to deploy CDR really has to think critically about democratic principles that are going to govern this ecosystem and how they can be employed as rules of engagement so we can learn how to separate good actors from bad actors. And, um, and you know, policy has a really, really strong role in, in elevating marginalized groups to make sure that they're hurt on this front. So thank you. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. And I wonder if any any of the other panel, it's a big question, obviously, there's a lot there and you're all looking at it from different perspectives. So if anyone has anything else to add on those points, please do weigh in. I, I'd just like to chime in and add and to reiterate Simone's point and also given the audience that, that we're speaking to, to highlight and emphasize that this sector is at a very early stage. It is nascent, but it needs to become a gigaton scale that is billions of tons a year, trillion dollar industry. And given how early we are, it is critical for policymakers and it is an opportunity for policymakers to be able to shape it in a way that allows the sector to scale in a way that is timely, effective, responsible, equitable, and sustainable along the lines of the, the principles that, that Simone was just articulating. And I think that you are in a really enviable spot right now to be able to take the mantle of leadership for moving the, the ball forward and setting the, the guidelines and ground rules for how um, this sector will, will develop. Great, thanks. Yeah, uh, and I'll just add very briefly, uh, I definitely agree with, um, with with what Jason just said. And, you know, one, one thing I just want to sort of maybe dial a little bit more focus on um, in reference to Simone, your comments, um, which, which were, I thought were excellent, um, is uh, just around the timing here, uh, because, you know, what we're experiencing today is a 1.1 degree world, and that is already full of environmental disasters caused by the climate crisis. Uh, and so, you know, yes, we need to be doing work now to prepare for the future. And at the same time, the faster we can get to CDR, which is safe and scalable, uh, and which uh, incorporates um, climate justice, the faster we can start to mitigate the impacts that are already being felt today, especially by underserved populations um, around the US and around the world. Excellent. And yeah, Joanna, if you have anything to add to that, I know that there's a lot that was covered that you probably sympathize with, but feel free. No, I mean, I think the one thing that I would add, uh, you know, is that as an early buyer, this is something that we ask projects about all of the time is how they're thinking about for these first deployments, community engagement, how they're thinking about environmental justice milestones, how they're thinking about that deployment arc. Um, and it's something that we take really seriously, not only in the diligence, but also in how we shape contracting. And so I think there's just an outsized impact that we can have as early participants in in kind of creating that arc in the direction that we wanted to, to go. Great. And now I know Raid is going to um, move on to a, another question, which really starts to dig down into what a particular solution looks like and one that already is as a, a, a initial footprint uh, in the state of New York. So go ahead, Raid. I think you have a question for Tom. Yeah. So Tom is leading one of the first field trials in ocean based carbon dioxide removal through the organization Vesta. Tom, could you speak a little bit about your solution, how this pilot came to life? on Long Island and some learnings that you could share to make field research and CDR implementation more successful at the local level? Sure, absolutely. Well, I mean, I guess maybe maybe just take a little bit of a step back um, because I think a lot of times when, when we think about nature-based carbon removal, a lot of people think about trees, um, but the main way that uh, the earth has removed carbon dioxide from the atmosphere over geological time and kept it in balance is actually through the ocean. Um, ultimately turning that carbon dioxide in, into rock. Um, and so um, there's a there's a number of different ocean-based uh, CDR approaches um, that are uh, some of the most scalable and promising approaches to carbon removal. Um, and the particular one that we um, that we are doing and that we've um, piloted in the state um, <clears throat> is called coastal carbon capture. And, and actually what I'd love to do is just share a slide or two here to um, uh, to explain it. So I'm going to share my screen here. So, so what, what we do at Vesta is we uh, accelerate the Earth's natural geological carbon removal process. Um, and so the left-hand side of this page shows you that natural process. This is what has kept the atmosphere in balance over geological time. Um, so rainwater falling on volcanic rocks causes that carbon dioxide to enter the water and it's ultimately stored as limestone on the ocean floor. Um, that's a great thing, um, but it's a slow process. And we accelerate that with coastal carbon capture by taking a natural mineral called olivine out of the ground, grinding it into sand to make carbon removing sand, and then adding that sand to coastal systems. 
where it gradually dissolves uh, permanently and safely removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now, as um, as you mentioned, Chris, we've um, we've done a, a pilot here in, in in the state of New York. Um, so um, we um, we were looking for a place to do a pilot, and you know, by way of by way of context, as many of you are probably aware, sea levels are rising and coastlines are eroding. And across the U.S., there's about 60 million tons of sand that's actually deployed every year by the coastal protection industry to uh, replace these eroded beaches. And so we found a location in the town of Southampton on Long Island um, with uh, with all the right characteristics. So the town needed sand. They were planning a beach renourishment project. And so uh, we worked with the local town leadership and, and the local coastal engineering firm who were excited about doing the world's very first field pilot of coastal carbon capture. Uh, another great thing is our um, academic collaborators um, from a scientific perspective at Stony Brook, which is down the road. So we worked closely with the local community. We applied for the state and federal permits, received them and deployed uh, olivine sand on the beach. Uh, and actually, I'm just going to show you uh, show you a little video here. So this is from the town of Southampton. This is the beach that had just been renourished. And you can see here the olivine sand being added to the beach. Uh, and so then since then, we've been our scientists have been studying this site, uh, taking all the measurements we need to both measure carbon removal um, and measure any ecological effects uh, of what's going on. Um, the results have been, I don't have time to go into it all now, but the results have been very positive, um, both from a carbon removal and an ecological safety safety standpoint. And the local community has um, has been very supportive of the project and really liked it. So in, in terms of, uh, in terms of kind of, I think the question was partly about sort of lessons learned. Um, uh, you know, th this is a this is a new technology, and um, and so you know what we want to do is normalize this. You know, olivine is a natural mineral. It's found on beaches, places like Hawaii and Guam. Um, you know, the regulators and the local community had a lot of questions, and that was understandable. Uh, but what what we'd like to do is normalize the use of olivine sand in in projects like this. You know, as part of coastal protection, so we can turn this industry carbon negative, meet the state's climate climate goals, and create new jobs in the process. Um, I think the other thing, to, just to close my comments, is that um, something that we've learned is that is that at this small scale, it's pretty expensive, and there's a lot of R and D to do. Uh, and so, um, you know, we need um, greater commitment to funding both R&D and also govern, uh, government led uh, procurement of CDR, as, as Chris was talking about earlier, to really help bring our technology and others like it to maturity. You now, you've heard about things like the DAC hubs in 45Q uh, probably before and, and in Chris's presentation, uh, ocean based solutions don't qualify for those. Um, and so one of the things we're doing is advocating for more tech neutral support from state and federal levels of government to help catalyze the innovation that um, that is going to be required in order to turn the turn ocean based CD, CDR into a uh, mature climate solution. Yeah, I know the CREST Act that I did reference, in fact, I think is, is an effort to expand the eligibility um, in terms of providing catalytic support. That's a good segue, though, actually, because I know. Uh, Raid is a question for Joanna now. And as we said at the beginning, we think what Frontier is doing creates an amazing template that can readily be adopted and expanded by governments. And so Raid has a question about that and would love to get into the details about how the mechanics of that work a bit. So go ahead, Raid. Yeah, so just a little bit of background. Um, Joanna is leading carbon removal procurement at Frontier and Advanced Market Committee to produce nearly a billion dollars of carbon removal by 2030. Given this model will likely inspire procurement strategy at a state and federal levels, could you speak about the few key aspects of your project selection criteria and how you came to the strategy of Frontier? And how can the federal government learn from and apply what you've initiated at another order of magnitude? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first off, thanks for, for having us here. It's a fun discussion. Uh, and yeah, happy to chat more about the motivation behind why we launched Frontier, kind of how how it works and how we think about carbon removal buying, uh, and then there's a few kind of learnings from that from that model. Um, so I think you know, as multiple have touched on, um, you know, we know we that we need carbon removal to the tune of of gigatons uh, per year to hit IPCC climate targets. But the the solutions that we have today, uh, as as some have alluded to, are really early stage and very expensive. And so as a result, we've really been stuck in this kind of chicken chicken and egg situation where 
CDR solutions are, are really expensive, so they lack buyers. And yet without that strong customer demand, they really can't come down the, the supply curve um, and uh, get uh, reach scale and get cheaper. And so in 2019, uh, Stripe was thinking about how, where do we play in the climate space and where can we um, have impact? And so we started buying permanent carbon removal um, sort of as an experiment at any price with the aim to really drive supply down the cost curve. We deployed about 15 million over 18 months uh, and starting to see a little bit of an effect, but realizing it was nowhere, nowhere near the, the order of magnitude that we needed to be um, for the pace that we needed to operate at. And so we started to talk with economists to figure out what what, what is a creative model um, or a pre-market mechanism that would really build on, on what we've been doing and pull forward some of that buyer demand to send a signal to folks to start building and that there is that available demand in the marketplace. And so that was the, the motivation behind launching Frontier in, in April of last year. Uh, as Chris, you mentioned, we launched this in partnership with a number of companies um, and a commitment basically to spend about 900 million in uh, buying permanent carbon removal over the next nine years. And we intentionally structured the model to be super flexible demand that can go after that, that gap and to be highly tech neutral. So we have a set of target criteria that we purchase carbon removal around. Uh, Vesta is one of them. Uh, but we, within that uh, set of target criteria, we are super technology agnostic. We think we need a portfolio of, of technologies and it's too early to pick uh, one winner in today's market. Um, so in terms of how we work, let me just share my screen quickly if I, if I can. Okay, awesome. Um, so Frontier really facilitates purchases on behalf of buyers. Uh, we partner with a, a large independent scientific advisory of about 60 experts. We run regular RFPs to diligence and select early companies that match that criteria. Uh, across technologies, and then we match buyers and sellers to those those purchases. And so broadly, we're looking to buy what we think is high quality carbon removal. I think you'll get different answers on what that looks like from different folks. But for us, that is really selecting for attributes that we think can lead to both quality climate outcomes and responsible deployment that continues to grow the support at a community and broader level for CDR. So we use basically three lenses for procurement. The first is, does this approach uh, and proposal have a path to delivering against this criteria um, over time? Um, so is it a permanent solution, removing carbon for a thousand years or more? Does it have the potential to be low cost and high volume? Uh, so high climate impact and at a price palpable for a broader market, uh, even if it's not today? Second, can this team execute on their proposed solution? So is it feasible from an execution standpoint? And then third, portfolio. So is a purchase from this company contributing to a diverse risk-adjusted portfolio of carbon removal solutions? And that comes back to our, our kind of philosophy that our role as an early buyer isn't to pick one bet and go uh, kind of double down on that, but really to get a, a lot of shots on goal so that by the time 2030, 2040, 2050 rolls around, we have a lot of conviction in uh, what the solution set is that is really getting us to that scale. Um, and I think that that also comes down to kind of the trade-offs across different technologies, right? So Chris, you talked about the different set that we have. There are some like direct air capture that are really easy to measure, but have trade-offs in terms of cost and energy use today. You have others that are low energy, but take a lot of minerals um, and we could deploy them quickly, but they might be more difficult to measure in field, like enhanced weathering. And so being able to balance across these trade-offs and build the right portfolio um, and deployment set geographically, we also think is, is important. Um, in terms of the other mechanics, we buy carbon removal uh, through two tracks. So pre-purchases and off-takes. Pre-purchases for us are really small dollar buys that uh, are designed to support a first pilot project for a company coming out of an academic lab or uh, early development. The rest uh, of our capital is reserved for offtakes. So large multi-million dollar, multi-year contracts for companies that are uh, designed to, to scale up. Um, 
last year we made about 15 pre-purchases across technologies, including actually two out of out of uh, with roots in New York. So Sela coming out of Colombia, um, they do mineralization in, in Kenya, uh, basalt formations, and then carbon to stone, which is using waste slag from steel production in New York to capture CO2. Um, so I want to make sure we're saving time for discussion, but just to take a step back to give you a sense of, of where we are, this square is really the, the kind of 4 billion uh, tons of CO2 that we need to permanently remove every single year by 2050. And that tiny orange pixel is roughly what we've removed cumulative, cumulatively to date. Uh, and so to get carbon removal to this order of magnitude, the, the voluntary carbon market will not be able to, to support that scale. Um, roughly 4 billion tons at $100 a ton uh, target future price is about half a trillion annual market for CDR. And so we really need government procurement and uh, and partnership for CDR to scale at the required pace. I think the other piece, and we kind of talked about this earlier, but Simone kind of mentioned uh, the influence that government can have at, at these early stages. And I think that's something that we found as well. Um, I'm happy to go into that more, but we've seen that by um, creating incentives and strings around our purchases in the form of milestones and contracts or renewal criteria, or even in our selection criteria around um, community engagement, safety, ecosystem impacts, we're able to really uh, help like nudge uh, the trajectory in the in the way that we're hoping to see. Um, and so happy to talk about that, that more if there's questions there. Yeah, um, I, I'd like to just add on to that if we can, because this is kind of the crux of the matter here, I think. If we think about if you could just, and then if others could respond to this as well, Joanna, um, in terms of where you see what you've done at Stripe, how that would mechanically and in practice maybe translate to a, a government program. I'm just curious to to kind of know your thoughts on that, about how that sort of transition could happen. And if you could also just quickly let us know, where are you seeing that happening already? Or at least where are the discussions globally and in the United States where we're starting to see real curiosity and interest from policymakers and what you've done and an interest in translating that into actual law or policy? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I will caveat by saying that I am, I am uh, not the policy uh, guru on our team. And that would be Jane, uh, for those who know her. But I think for the way that we think about it is if you can create a program in terms of government procurement that is able to um, be flexible in terms of the price point today, uh, but encourage and motivate price declines over time. You can create a program that allows for tech neutrality. So both supports buying from well-known players like DAC, but also supports um, some of the earlier open system solutions uh, like ocean alkalinity enhancement or enhanced weathering to really create that uh, portfolio approach. If you can create uh, selection criteria that filter for durability uh, and high quality CDR solutions that are, are safe and equitable. Um, and then if you can kind of package that procurement alongside R&D incentive structures or uh, nudges with industrial process integration or energy deployment that you want to see, I think those are a few of the places where we can see government programs be especially effective. The other thing that I would say is that we've we started having a number of conversations with folks beyond the U.S. who are really uh, kind of interested in creating carbon removal flywheels uh, around the the industry. So um, we talked to to a nation who was thinking about trying to build out an accelerator program to incubate new technologies, along with um, research and grant incentives, along with um, guaranteed buys. We've heard that from a number of places. So I think there's a lot of space for, for creativity here. Um, but curious what, what others would, would say on that front. And I wonder if I could just pivot to Jason there to do sort of two things. Uh, and again, we've asked, you know, folks have questions to please ask them. We don't have any questions. It's a lot of information. So just listening to it, we'll be following up with you with the video as well as your colleagues. So uh, you'll have ample opportunity to direct questions uh, to us after the session. Um, but Jason, um, be really interested to know, you know, in your reply, you know, tell us a little bit about, more about what the DAC coalition is doing, but I'm really interested in what all the panelists think about what, what would be the value of a government purchasing program for their respective sectors, and what are the sort of the ideal model elements 
that are inspired from Frontier and other places that you would want to see in a government, federal government purchasing program. So Jason, if you want to take that first and tell us a little bit about the DAC coalition along the way. Yeah, so the Director of Capture Coalition, as we noted earlier, is a global nonprofit multi-stakeholder coalition organization of now over 75 companies and organizations and academic and research institutions working to help it advance and accelerate the development and deployment of direct air capture technology to help uh, address the climate crisis. And we are acting as really a, a platform for education, for collaboration, and for connectivity throughout this emerging market ecosystem, trying to help educate and inform uh, key decision makers and policymakers and the general public and media and advocacy groups as to what direct air capture is, what role it has to play, and how it can you know best be advanced, as well as serving as a entity to help build and support the capacity of the folks on the ground trying to get this technology developed and deployed and to do so in a way that is timely, effective, and, and responsible. In in terms of um, Chris's question, your question, Chris, as to what role government has to play, I think that is critical for government to help provide tailwinds for the companies and the innovators in this space that are working to get um, you know, this technology deployed and get the excess carbon dioxide out of, out of the atmosphere to help limit the um, the extent of, of climate change impacts. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to, to other folks if uh, if they want to jump in, jump in as well. Yeah, and I, I wonder both uh, Simone um, and, and, and Tom, you know, again, if we just thought of sort of a wish list or what would be a model sort of approach that we're going to have specifically on purchasing, if we're looking at, at CDR procurement. Um, Dr. Stewart, I'd be really interested in, you know, some of the elements that you started off with about how do we ensure we bake in uh, elements to the policy that are equitable uh, and also distribute the value of CDR broadly? Um, so I'm curious if you could weigh in, both of you, on what would be your wish list for a government carbon uh, purchasing program? I think that um, Massachusetts actually did a really great job in their uh, CDR procurement bill with really trying to bake in, like we said, um, can social considerations. And so one of the things that I really appreciated about that example is there was a lot of transparency that they required. So they said that, you know, they they would publicize the bids, they would talk about who was selected, uh, information about survey work would be published, The um, each one of the bids had to do a certain amount of survey work with communities to try and figure out what the implications of their uh, their technology or strategy would be on the community. I think that we're starting to see models of um, how Justice 40 looks in enacted in federal policy legislation as well with uh, the, the funding opportunity announcements that have come out related to all kinds of new infrastructure, but uh, realizing that a big chunk of it, 20% of the scorecard goes to community benefit agreements and having a plan to engage with communities. And that's, you know, going from 0% looking at really just techno technology merit to now requiring 20% of the scorecard to be about how much this strategy is going to benefit communities and how much the the actors behind this have thought about that. So I really think that that is uh, there's some really great opportunities in legislation that's already passed and some of the the FOAs that have come out from the from DOE and other agencies to talk about how we can build this kind of thing in. But for me, really, the transparency and and the data to to back all of uh, all of the claims up are really important. Yeah, absolutely, could not agree more. Um, and Tom, I'm curious, just from the perspective of a policy implementer. Uh, that you've already described your 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 technology. Um, what are you looking for from a government purchasing program in addition to what's already been said? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, it, it's important, of course, for there to be um, for there to be clear and transparent standards um, to ensure that um, bad actors don't show up. And you know, the the last thing we need is a whole bunch of fraud here that would um, that would sort of tarnish the whole industry. So we need um, you know we need good standards and verification. Um, I mean the, the the big thing here is, um, you know, we need approaches that support a wide range of technologies, so-called tech-neutral approaches, right? Uh, 
45Q is only for direct air capture. The DAC hubs are only for direct air capture. Nothing against you, Jason. Um, you know, we, we need we need a lot of approaches, and having a lot of approaches includes direct air capture, but it also includes a whole bunch of other very promising approaches. And so we need to, uh, you know, we need to wake up and look at the um, the variety of permanent CDR approaches, uh, including ocean-based approaches, which have a lot of um, you know have a lot of potential given the carbon. Um, capture potential of the oceans and, and really make sure that there's a level playing field so so the uh, the technologies can exist on their own merits rather than um, rather than the government sort of picking favorites yeah and I, that's a great uh, sort of place for us to land I think for for a conclusion is that I referenced the two pieces of legislation that were introduced in the last Congress and our understanding is is they will be uh, reintroduced in this Congress that's the federal carbon dioxide removal leadership act and the crest act and I think there's many merits to those bills that both of you just highlighted. Um, one is that there's very, very uh, thoughtful, considered um, uh, standards around uh, equity uh, and engagement uh, in the CDRLA, and both in different ways and by different criteria have pretty expansive portfolios um, that they are looking at, not just sort of putting all of our eggs or all of our chips in one place, but the point at this point should really be about diversification. It's it's not so much about how much carbon do we remove this decade. It's about how do we find out those solutions that are going to work the best and most efficiently and cost effective that we can scale into future decades. So I do hope, and Open Air will certainly be advocating for that legislation, uh, those pieces of legislation as they're reintroduced. Uh, in the last two minutes, I wonder if uh, time does fly. And again, I'm excited to be able to share this video uh, with all who attended RSVP as well as the entire delegation and to use this excellent conversation to uh, raise understanding and continue the conversation. But do folks, uh, any of our panel have any sort of final thoughts, uh, big things on their mind uh, that are most important when we think about CDR, particularly and what the federal government can do to advance it? I know we've I said a lot already. Th throw out one, one stat. Um, a Rhodium Group report from a few years ago did analysis of, of potential job creation opportunities in this particular to DAC, but um, you know the the job creation lens I think uh, applies broadly. But one megaton direct air capture facility would support thirty five hundred jobs directly and indirectly throughout the supply chain, and that single facility would employ uh, roughly two hundred seventy eight uh, full time you know workers. And this these are quality jobs that I just want to. Um, Highlight there's a great opportunity to uh, to to build a, a a new industry that would provide a lot of uh, employment opportunities. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, we kind of covered a lot of what I uh, uh, was sort of hoping to get at in that last question in our excellent discussion here. Again, we're at time. Uh, that was a fast hour, but I do look forward to. Uh, engaging with uh, members of the delegation, and hopefully in the 118th Congress, we can uh, we can see some big things happen uh, to support CDR through purchasing. So I want to thank our volunteers, uh, and I also want to thank our panel uh, for their excellent input, and for those of you who attended. And uh, we will be in touch with the video by by tomorrow. So thank you everyone for joining. Thanks, Al. Thank you. I'll just leave thank the uh, on for a minute. If anybody wants to copy any links, we'll be sending links as well. But uh, feel free to sign off, but I'll, I'll leave it on for just a bit longer.